this presentation on the uh, current status of, of uh, COVID vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines, is uh, motivated obviously by the uh, pandemic. Uh, but it's really a follow-up on uh, last spring, I had a uh, class an introduction to uh, biomolecular engineering where I had I put together a um, uh, basically a presentation on the status of the 150 odd therapeutics and vaccines that were uh, coming on uh, online or, or at least under development. Uh, now here we are in, in December uh, of the following year and uh, we're about to undergo the administration of, of the, the, uh, the vaccines that have uh, made it thus far. And uh, I find it, uh, the, the, the goal of this isn't really so much the understanding of just the sort of virus technology itself or the, the vaccine technology itself, but also to appreciate the breadth of uh, the chemical processing industry's sort of contribution to making this happen uh, so fast. It may not seem that fast <laughs> for many, but uh, it certainly has been in, in the context of the, uh, the pharmaceutical world. So. Um, the, uh, the two that are, are um, certainly um, at present and uh, in the present right now is the so-called Pfizer or the uh, BioNTech uh, collaboration, and the, as well as the Moderna Lanza, uh, which are both mRNA vaccines, which are not vaccines that have previously uh, been used. And so I'll have a little background on, on how it's different, I should say, than uh, than others. Uh, then I'm going to go through some of the other things, looking at the, I call this the anatomy. I'm going to look at the actual adjuvants, the other things that are in a vaccine that beyond the quote unquote uh, active ingredient. Um, and then a little uh, cursory look at some of the other um, uh, vaccines that are, that are on the way. So there with that, we're going to start. We've all seen the, uh, the, 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 the beautiful uh, renditions of the spike protein, which I'll, I'll note here is a trimeric. There's three different, um, or three of the same, uh, that ultimately give rise to what is, is ultimately the target for most of these vaccines. Uh, for those, it's called epitope. This is what the antibody would recognize um, uh, to facilitate this. Now, uh, if we take a look back to uh, the uh, Kenny introduction to uh, biomolecular enge engineering, uh, last, uh, I started with a, a little bit of a discussion of, of the nature of the immunities. Um, I'm not going to go into those sort of details now, but really say focus on, on here. And that is, we want for vaccination. The goal is to um, have a, a memory cell, uh, B cell, um, recognize uh, the antigen. In this case, the spike protein, the little dimples here. Um, so that the body will be making the antibody. So when you're exposed, it'll essentially uh, target the destruction of it. So um, with that being said, um, this uh, little introduction here is, is it, it certainly doesn't do it justice. Uh, a traditional vaccine is to produce the antigen, that is to inject uh, the antigen or um, or even the attenuated version of the virus, or, or uh, yeah, there's various different types. I have covered the various classes of, of vaccines before, but I really want to focus on uh, the mRNA, uh, mRNA. So rather than producing the protein uh, and, and making that antigen uh, introduced, is to actually produce the mRNA and deliver that. And that introduces a lot of interesting challenges. First of all, mRNA is not very stable. Um, and most have already heard about some of the issues of trying to distribute this vaccine. That's a challenge there. Uh, but at the same time, it has some elements of uh, not being, for instance, containing the whole uh, virus itself. You're just simply uh, introducing the message to make the protein, and therefore the protein would be made uh, in that. So um, this was really a slide actually from the, uh, the talk I gave last uh, uh, April. Uh, and at that time, there had been um, there's 161 vaccines and treatments in development. And, I, and obviously, I'm not going to be able to uh, do justice. And I apologize for the simplicity. And I try to do my best to provide URLs and so forth for those who want to follow up and see where the sources and certainly acknowledge those that have created 
uh, this this information. Um, I wanted to first start by looking at the process of, of this because it, it's, it's quite a bit different than, for instance, the lectures that I've given on making it monoclonal antibodies. Uh, there's some similarities up front. Uh, I, what you're doing here is actually producing the plasmid uh, because the plasmid then will then ultimately uh, give rise to the DNA sequence that will make the message, uh, the message that will be the actual injectable drug. So the plasmid production is a bioreactor operation. And from what I could see on the sites of some of those uh, that did this, including uh, by uh, GeneScript uh, and um, some of the GMP, manufacturing and so forth here is that um, the this will be done in with E. coli, uh, which makes sense, a high copy number plasmid. And then based on numbers I could find, GMP, which is something that's going to come up again and again, good manufacturing practices. This is basically pharmaceutical grade materials. Um, um, came out to roughly a half quarter million dollars for a gram. So presumably one can make uh, a lot. Uh, of messenger RNA from that. Um, and so this plasmid needs to be purified okay, from the bacteria that's making it. And that's typically done by things like on off chromatography. Um, and, and then from there, uh, the idea is you actually can linearize this by cutting it. Um, and then th from there, the synthetic uh, uh, the uh, RNA polymerase, uh, like a T7, like a phage, like a, a bacteriophage, is used um, to make from the double-stranded uh, plasmid the actual messages here. Uh, you don't want uh, DNA in what you're going to be in injecting into people, so then you treat it with DNA to to destroy that. And there's some interesting things here that are are part of this process, and including uh, putting synthetic nucleotides uh, into that. So this mRNA is actually not like a natural mRNA. It has more stability, which is important uh, because mRNA does not last very long. And certainly if you just injected normal mRNA, it wouldn't very last, it would last minutes. It wouldn't be long enough to get the antigenic response that you're after. So uh, in order to protect it, what you do is you actually can take that mRNA and put it into a liposome um, Called a nanoparticle, but it's just it's just basically a liposome where you have the typical hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails. This needs to go into formulation then and then distributed. And one of the things that has been uh, in the news a lot about, for instance, the quote unquote uh, uh, Pfizer uh, slash uh, vaccine, is this inherent instability of the um, mRNA means that uh, there's a very important aspect is the distribution and cold chain management uh, where something like this has to be uh, under nearly cryogenic conditions like minus 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, and so uh, with that being said, this is sort of the background where I want to go into the details of the actual vaccine itself. Um, I threw Moderna, Moderna in here because one of the advantages, of it, there's going to be a lot more vaccine candidates coming along. Uh, and many of those are going to have characteristics uh, that are different from this one, but this one is, has, has come forward uh, quickly, which is important. Um, this is actually a fact sheet from the, uh, the um, uh, what was given the patients that are being given the vaccine now in, in the United Kingdom. And so from that, uh, it tells you what's inside it. So this is the anatomy here, the anatomy of this COVID-19 vaccine. Um, now, I mentioned that it's an it's a RNA, okay, but there's a lot of other stuff in there. And this other things are, are really quite important, uh, including polyethylene glycol, uh, which is part of protecting this from being destroyed. Uh, and there's some very complicated looking names here, but these are basically uh, like the lipids that make up the membranes of, of your cells. Um, and um, there's cholesterol is actually added in here. There's salts here for buffers and, and, and so forth, as well as sugar. Um, and so I'm going to go through some of this because I think it's important to recognize that the reason why 
uh, the vaccine is coming out so quickly is there's a lot of, let's say, borrowing or, or taking the, what was uh, available from the development of many other vaccines and so forth and, and putting those together uh, into uh, this particular technology, which is an encapsulated uh, messenger RNA to make the spike protein inside there. Um, and this I started here because I thought it was kind of, kind of interesting uh, to, that uh, I think there's a, it's easy to take for granted what it takes to launch a vaccination program for mil not millions, but hundreds of millions and ultimately billions of people. Um, and uh, this vaccine, this particular one, actually needs multiple doses. And you can kind of imagine uh, the amount of vials that are needed are, are quite amazing. And there's problems associated with vials. That actually, some of the technologies that Corning just recently developed from Valor glass is better than borosilicate. Uh, borosilicate is better than sort of the window pane glasses, which is more like a, a silica uh, glass. And and uh, these are actually funded from uh, BARDA, some, some, some major uh, advancements here. Uh, which is Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. So the federal government has been stepping in and, and, and is, uh, among other things, going to be buying and distributing uh, um, this vaccine basically to help the economy recover. Um, and so um, just sort of a, a call out here, I guess, to the many things, I mean, from the caps to the syringes to you name it, uh, all of these have to come into play, and, and, and in particular, um, the, the vials have to be able to survive or, or be trans, uh, being uh, stored at you know, minus 70 degrees, taken out, and so on and so forth. Um, those are important characteristics that, that aren't normally something that uh, uh, historic vaccines have required. Um, the whole liposome concept here um, is that we're going to place the, um, the, the RNA is placed inside a, a little vesicle. And you see the schematics of what a, phos a phospholipid bilayer is. Uh, this is a planar version of it here where you have the, the hydrophobic and hydrophilic. But this is basically uh, the outside of the cell, if you will. And, and so uh, what I've done here is I've shaded sort of like the tails of these complex molecules that are, these are the actual ones inside the, uh, the uh, vaccine, um, uh, and including cholesterol. So there's cholesterol that's in there that actually, what that does is it increases the uh, fluidity of the membranes because we need to have these eventually be taken up into the cell to release the message and then that message will make the actual uh, uh, protein. So um, this is intended to kind of give you an idea at the molecular level what it is we're, we're look, looking at here. And here's the, here's the hydrophilic uh, parts of these lipids and these the hydrophobic. And then the, the, uh, the cholesterol uh, would be intercalated uh, into that to make uh, the actual liposome itself, which introduces the issue of kind of where do they come from? Um, certainly cholesterol is, is something that um, is relatively easy to get a hold of. In fact, it's actually a component of, 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 of some, some medias and things we've, we've worked with before. Um, and so it is synthesized by all animals. It's relatively inexpensive. But one thing you have to recognize is that it's been pretty important to avoid avoid animal derived products in, in drug production. And number two, do it under good manufacturing practices. In other words, it has to be pharmaceutical grade. Now one can do pharmaceutical grade production if you're still willing to have that uh, from an animal source. Um, but one of the things about this particular vaccine, the, uh, the Pfizer uh, vaccine, we'll call it for this, uh, is, is that it, um, they didn't want uh, animal-based products, which is, seems like a quandary if, if, for the most part, cholesterol is produced uh, by animals. Uh, part of the motivation of elimination of um, animal products in vaccines is, uh, you know, if you remember mad cow disease, uh, which is now the prion disease that we have actually in Pennsylvania for the deer population and throughout a lot of the US now. Um, 
that those prions uh, are a concern, obviously, if you're doing an injectable drug, is they want to eliminate uh, the, uh, those products in those. Um, we've mentioned in production platforms that adjuvants, these are things that help the immune response, help protect the molecules and so forth. Uh, squalene used to be used a lot. Um, and squalene was actually um, harvested from deep sea sharks they, because they needed a certain degree of buoyancy deep in the ocean. Uh, they had the ideal large quantities of this, uh, but there was a moratorium on uh, deep sea uh, shark uh, uh, that. And so there's, that's the motivation of why you see some of these interesting stories come up. You know, in other words, is, is this going to be a, a problem? And we had actually discussed that uh, there are um, efforts, for instance, to produce adjuvants by alternative platforms again. It's a recurring theme in this class that I, I had just got done teaching is, is looking at the future of, of bioproduction of molecules. We have a lot of different alternatives in hand. And in this case, there's actually uh, tobacco that has been genetically engineered to make squalene so that you no longer need to obtain that uh, from sharks. But um, that being the case, uh, good manufacturing practices means that not only do you need to find it and, and, and you need to then process it in a way that's completely uh, validated and controlled uh, for the FDA to allow it to be used in a vaccine formulation like this. Uh, there are companies, entire companies, you should be aware of this, uh, certainly as a student uh, that, that in the support of the pharmaceutical industry, uh, like uh, Parkem, which is a chemical supplier. Uh, and they're not just simply a company that, that, that finds the international markets and, and moves them around, but they actually have their own uh, testing and validation and so forth to supply these materials to the pharmaceutical industry, uh, which are, are, are quite important. Uh, if you dig a little deeper into this, because uh, I was trying to figure out how uh, one got plant-based cholesterol, it turns out that there is a company, uh, Will Shaw Te Technologies, that has GM, uh, GMP compliant, uh, animal origin free vegetable <laughs> uh, based uh, cholesterol. Um, and uh, it is registered with the FDA, a drug master file and so forth. Um, and if you take a look at this, this is a company actually, it's out, it's near Princeton uh, in uh, New Jersey. Um, it's actually a subsidiary or a company that's owned by Ivonic, which is uh, a specialty chemicals company. And again, there's so many players here that you may not have heard of as a, as a, a, as a student, shall we say, kind of like the, oh, I think of pharmaceuticals as being Lilly and Merck and, and Pfizer and AstraZeneca. Uh, there's a lot of other players. And Ivonic has, is a large company, specialty company, international, that has 32,000 uh, employees. And when you take a look at this, you know, one of the things that they had on their web page was referring to the fact that the lipid nanoparticle technology that's used for delivery for the COVID um, is a technology that they, uh, quote unquote, they own as part of that, as their subsidiary, which is Wilshire. Um, and so I think it's important to recognize then that when we talk about uh, the launching, if you will, of a, uh, of a vaccine, uh, that there's going to be a lot of traditional chemical processing that comes into, into play here, uh, not just simply uh, biologics, if you will, for that. Um, if we take a look uh, at alternative platforms for that, there certainly is alternatives. Uh, there has been yeast, has been genetically engineered to make cholesterol. There's biotransformations. I found some patents associated with the actual taking of plant sterols uh, and converting them to human hormonal analogs. Uh, so certainly that's another biotransformation is another possibility. And certainly recently there's actually been the, uh, the transplant or the modification of uh, plant cholesterol biosynthetic pathways, because it turns out that there are, there is cholesterol um, made by some uh, plants. In fact, tomato is ironically, interestingly, one of those that facilitated that. And I provide these references just so you can sort of think about um, the supply chain as it would be modified depending on uh, which of these uh, alternative platforms you could get that from. Now, some of these other molecules are, are pretty complicated looking. Uh, this one here, 
uh, DPSC. Uh, you have to take a little pause to, to what it is. It's a phosphate group out here. And you have your, uh, it's basically, basically this is phosphocholine, uh, which is common to um, membrane lipids. Uh, but it's a synthetic version uh, of it based on octadecanoic acid. Um, and when you start to dig a little bit deeper into this, um, I eventually managed to find that uh, the uh, pulmion here, uh, Scientific, uh, which is a specialty chemical uh, company on making uh, uh, lipids, um, clear, indicated on the website that they were actually making the specific ingredient uh, for this um, uh, quote unquote, uh, Pfizer uh, BioNTech uh, COVID vaccine. Um, and uh, now I, I threw in some other things because along the way I started to realize there's a lot of different ones that, uh, and especially chemical companies that do have a connection directly to that. So uh, I guess it's XLE here, um, is also uh, a lipid uh, nanoparticle formulation company. Uh, that one that I just happened to be across. Just trying to give you an example that there's a lot of, of, of we'll call them small companies, uh, but that have and support that. And in fact, they go through the process of, of providing these materials under good manufacturing practices so that they can be an add-in uh, to the formulation by the by big pharma or what I'll be talking about later is contract manufacturing, uh, CMOs. Um, the Pegylation here is an interesting aspect of this one too, because remember that uh, the RNA itself is not stable. And so we need to put that RNA into a protective coating. Uh, what we just got done talking about was the cholesterol and the lipids that uh, made this uh, liposome, okay? Um, but then we need to protect even the liposome so the body won't uh, uh, attack it, I guess, is the way sort of looking at it here. Um, and these pink things here are, are that that's that's polyethylene glycol and so this right here which if again it's a very uh intimidating name but the nn di tetra uh decal acetamide uh well here's the acetamide here uh and then all it's saying is is in the two position here is where you add the polyethylene glycol but when you look at it then this would be the the little tails over here and this is the hydrophobic head. And then the polyethylene glycol is out into the median. So what a, it's kind of like coating it, if you will, with a little bit of, of, of a polymer uh, to hide it uh, from that. Um, and there's a little schematic here of, of, of the, it protects it from being proteolized. In other words, it can't come in here and try to chew on things. Um, um, but the, and, and the other thing is, is it, it kind of, in, think of it as protecting it from uh, the immune system uh, that kind of hides it and lets it kind of stand a longer half-life so it can get to the cells, release the mRNA and so forth. In the process of trying to figure this out, you know, who makes it and so forth, I ran across Crota, which happens to be one of their plants actually happens to be here in central Pennsylvania down the road. Um, and then I uh, found another one that was Polar Lipids, a company in Zambia, and then I found the Crota had just recently actually acquired them, which makes sense uh, in, in, in terms of a, a bit of a consolidation of expertise uh, that um, includes the production of materials by the specifications required for a drug like this. And so um, each one of these, I found you know, this is a, a, a peg supplier and so forth. There's so many players that come into play into making just the carrier. Remember, this is this is just simply the vessel that go, the, the vaccine inside that vial is protecting the messenger RNA inside this little core here. Um, so that's, uh, again, uh, a little bit more information of what's going on uh, there, if you will. Um, now, I, I, I uh, took this, much of this from the, um, the uh, Enviotech uh, page uh, realizing that there's actually two large companies they're working with. One is actually in, in China and separately. Uh, and the other is Pfizer for essentially uh, the rest of the world. 
Uh, Project Lightspeed, of course, was this idea of, of a, an incredible acceleration of the typical vaccine uh, development process. And so this German-based company here had on their webpage sort of a timeline, which is, is if anyone you know, if you understand that the normal process of this would be years. Um, and, and, and instead, uh, we're talking about in January 12th is when the sequence was made available. Uh, and I'll be showing you in a minute some of the other th major contributions that happened at amazing speed, including the elucidation of the structure of that protein, uh, which was necessary in order to change some of the, the sequences of the amino acids there uh, to stabilize it in the right form for the actual vaccine itself. So Fosan is, is the, that's the Chinese uh, collaboration, uh, and uh, our Fosan, and uh, I believe it, I'm pretty sure it's Chinese, I'm not. Uh, and, and Pfizer, uh, of course, is the European, uh, US uh, side of things. Um, so you can see that from essentially last year to in one, less than one year, we are actually anticipating uh, approval uh, is in front of the FDA for the next, I think they may even be meeting tomorrow. Uh, which is actually uh, today, based on the time now. Um, and so that's what's going on in, in, in this process of, of, of very rapidly bringing these things forward. Now, there's a couple of important things here. It's a two-dose regime, meaning that we ha have to go through this sort of twice, uh, and people have to be willing to get that second shot, which is an important discussion that's ongoing. Uh, and we are talking about millions and millions of doses, 300 million plus just in the United States. Um, so if you take a look at what you know has facilitated this kind of thing is the open source bioinformatic information um, was available. The sequence to the COVID uh, virus was almost immediately available and actually many, many versions of it so that people could take a look at it. Um, and it's a big protein. Uh, and it's a full-length spike protein in the uh, Pfizer um, mRNA. Uh, so we're talking about an mRNA that is, is, is uh, over 3,000 base pairs uh, to make when it is uh, uh, translated. Uh, that mRNA will actually ultimately make uh, over 1,000 amino acids is, is the spike protein itself. And then that spike protein has to get, three of them have to get together and they have to be in the right confirmation. That's all the important thing. And one aspect of this, uh, which I'll uh, explain in a minute, is, is that when you express it just as the protein itself, that's different than being on the virus. And therefore, if that confirmation is different uh, because it's not on the virus, you will not get the right antibody and the vaccine will not work. And so important work that I'm going to describe in a minute here was figuring out what that shape should be. And so in order to lock it into the right shape, they actually made two probing uh, mutations to that uh, to make that uh, function. Um, and so this is the key advances to accelerate, uh, if you will, de-risk this, because I mean, this is going very fast, but sometimes when you go very fast, you end up with a train wreck, right? Um, and so some, some things here, this was actually a CNE News, uh, that the, the coronavirus spike protein was, in, was, uh, was solved in a matter of weeks uh, uh, from the availability of, of, of that from actually a cryo-EM. Uh, cryo-EM is where you actually then like, literally use an electron microscope on, uh, under cryogenic conditions to take thousands of pictures of that and then use that to put together uh, the structure uh, that's in what they're referring to is the pre-fusion confirmation. So pre-fusion, what that means is, is that before it binds with the actual receptor, because that's what you need the antibody to. Now, knowing that, they then come up with some information about the configurations of this, which they refer to as an up and a down configuration here, just to kind of think of it as slightly, slightly different. Um, and the key aspect of this, which I had mentioned, is, is they put proline in it. And proline is this amino acid here, which is quite unique. Like most uh, pro, uh, 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 amino acids, like glycine here, um, don't have a, like a fusion of their little backbone. But proline is one that, that, that 
is actually bonded so that it gives rigidity to the structure of the protein. And that structure of the protein has been added to this because they knew what confirmation they need in order for this vaccine to give the right antigen uh, for the antibody production that will protect you after being injected with the mRNA that makes the protein, the protein then encoded slightly different than the native virus, but with the right shape so that you got the right antibody to protect it. If we take a look a little bit further, some interesting advances, and that is, is that, um, you know, remember that DNA is double-stranded, okay? But messenger RNA is single-stranded. So this picture here is just a reminder that we have the, uh, you know, the GCA and, and the uracil. This is typical mRNA. Um, but uh, part of the technology that BioNTech had developed for their mRNA vaccines was to make it more stable. And one way to do that was to feed, since this is a synthetic, uh, this is done in vitro, it's done in a, in a, in a, in a, in a tank. Um, you can add these si the nucleo nucleotides um, and have synthetic versions of it. So the pseudouridine, as opposed to uridine, is slightly different here, you can see in the side group. But by doing that, that actually enhances its stability so that it lives longer inside you and then expresses the protein uh, for a longer period of time, because that's what you need. You need it to make a lot of these spike proteins so that they'll assemble and actually make antibodies. Because your body needs to think that it was attacked with the virus in order to become vaccinated. I thought it was kind of ironic a little bit because many of the antivirals that have been popular and been, have been discussed in, in the last year, including uh, remdesivir, uh, is also a nucleoside analog. In other words, it's, it's also a synthetic version, but the synthetic versions were designed to mess up the virus. So the rapidly, the virus trying to amplify and make uh, copies of itself would, we'll call it accidentally, uh, put the wrong uh, nucleoside in there. And, and, and then as a result of that, it would basically kill the virus. The virus would fall apart. Um, in this case, it's the opposite. That basic idea of using a synthetic uh, nucleotide uh, allows us to make a more stable mRNA to get a better antigenic response in that uh, system. Now, if we, just as a reminder back to where we were just before I have some closing comments here, is that, you know, again, this maybe will help you to, to, to envision this whole process. Uh, up front, you have fermentations with E. coli. The E. coli makes large amounts of a plasmid. The plasmid is then purified by chromatography and so forth. Then it's cut to then make a, a, a open, uh, linearized. So you cut this plasmid so it's linearized. Then you put in the synthetic nucleosides as well as the natural ones as well. Uh, you actually put in a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase that then makes your product, your actual mRNAs that you want to deliver as the vaccine. You treat it with DNAs to chop up everything you don't want. And of course, more chromatography to get rid of the DNA pieces and purify it and so forth. Then place it into this liposome that has the cholesterol and uh, the pegylation, the polyethylene glycol coating. Uh, all of that then has to be placed into vials. And then those vials have to be uh, cryogenically, at least for cold chain management, distributed out throughout uh, the country uh, very efficiently and, and very carefully uh, to maintain the temperatures to make the vaccine stay stable. Um, so if we take a look then, there's a few other things. Of course, I can't even imagine trying to cover except for an entire course on, on, on what's going to happen here uh, in the other vaccines, because many other vaccines are taking the more traditional track. Okay, So if you take a look, I have just have a couple of them here, and I apologize to whatever company I may have uh, left out in the process here. Um, there's something like um, the adeno, adeno vectors here, so adenovirus, you know, like uh, uh, is, is the basis of the platform at J&J, &J, Johnson & Johnson. And so they have, are basically using, they, this isn't you know, their first um, rodeo, right? 
they've made vaccines before, including for Ebola, HIV, Zika. Um, and so they, they're going to use that, they are using that same technology to make a similar type uh, virus um, uh, vector. Uh, it's a non-replicating vector that you literally inject it into the, the person and then it, it uh, acts like, it looks like, if you will, it looks like to your body that it's the virus and therefore you make an antigenic uh, response. Uh, Merck also has some other ones and, 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 and the amount of overlap and, and things that are going on, uh, they have um, a, a, also a, a viral vector platform. Uh, they also acquired a measles based viral vector. So it's literally, they take something like the measles virus, which obviously is a bad thing. They take parts of it, they deconstruct it, then they put other pieces in and then that virus is no longer pathogenic, but it will actually make the protein like the spike protein uh, so that your body thinks it's been um, attacked by uh, the COVID-19 virus. Interestingly enough, uh, Merck has also had some large investments in Moderna. So Moderna is the, uh, let's call it the competitor of the Pfizer uh, BioNTech uh, vaccine. It's also an RNA vaccine. And so they're sort of uh, and part owner, that, you know, a couple hundred million dollars worth of stock, I suppose, in, 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 um, in Moderna. And so they have their hat in that ring as well. Uh, AstraZeneca uh, has some things that are on that fringe between therapeutics. Remember, therapeutics is what you give somebody when they get COVID. And then you try to help them, obviously. Uh, that's a therapeutic versus a vaccine is preventing them from getting the, the viral disease. Uh, these long-acting antibody combinations uh, at AstraZeneca uh, have sort of are on this border. They are both therapeutic and they also provide like prophylactic uh, vaccines and so forth. And they are in clinical trials now. Uh, technology happened after this came out of Vanderbilt and the collaboration is as actually AstraZeneca with, with Oxford. That's the one that they refer to as, as this particular one. Um, there's an encapsulated spoke spike protein um, from the no Novavax group. Um, one of my you know, since I did work in plant biotechnology a lot, I put in the trans, there's a transgenic plant platform where something like that is something that takes a much, much longer to develop, but has the potential of being much, much cheaper. Keep in mind that we're talking about something that we may need to vaccinate with millions or billions of people uh, every year uh, for, well, as long as, 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 as will certainly matter for many of us. Um, and so uh, transgenic plants as a platform actually provide some way of making a much cheaper vaccine than some of these high-tech fast ones they've developed here. Uh, Eli Lilly and, uh, and Regeneron seem to have stayed more on the therapy side, that is treating people who have COVID as opposed to vaccination um, against it. Um, and so I, I put them in here and that you can put some of the words that you can easily uh, Google if you'd like uh, to find out some more information about those. Um, the final things here is we can't certainly forget for the rest of the world, it is a pandemic after all. Uh, and the uh, Russian uh, 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 research center, shall we say, for, for uh, viral diseases has uh, advanced uh, a vaccine also based on adenovirus, uh, presumably similar to the J&J &J, uh, version there. Uh, and certainly there's, there's numerous uh, Chinese companies, spike protein so, uh, subunit antigen vaccine, uh, which is again, more traditional, uh, take the protein, make it and inject it where they're actually uh, you know, working with GSK uh, Smith, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, who has developed some adjuvants that are really good at activating the immune system. And so that's sort of key elements of this is not only the, the, the antigen, uh, but some of the uh, molecules that help. That's what an adjuvant is. Uh, there are others uh, that are have really rolled out some things. An inactivated vaccine is where you take a strain of the actual virus and you kill it. Uh, that's a classic. Uh, way of creating uh, vaccines going on back uh, to polio. And, and so 
Uh, those are actually being rolled out in millions of doses by Cinevac and others as, as well here. This is a, this pharmaceutical group is about a dozen different uh, pharma uh, companies within China. And uh, another inactivated, uh, that's supposed to be strain, not stain, uh, in uh, Covaxin is, is the vaccine development uh, pro program in, uh, in, in India. Um, the unsung heroes I put in here because I think a lot of you, uh, you shouldn't understand that, that a company's contract, the manufacturers, there's companies that uh, are less, if you will, um, names that you would be like uh, common household names like Eli Lilly and Merck and Pfizer and, uh, and so forth. Um, and these companies uh, do the, the hard work, the 24-7 shift work seven days a week. And, and believe me, they are, they are working on this now as we speak uh, to produce the millions of these. So uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific Pantheon uh, listed on their webpage that they're involved in 250 different projects related to antivirals, treatments, and so forth with that. Um, Catalent has 60 uh, COVID uh, compounds, which included J&J, &J, AstraZeneca, Moderna, and, and so forth. Um, a company like Emergent actually is a federal contractor. They're the ones that make the stockpiles associated with uh, the military and our reserves, if you will, of vaccines and so forth. Uh, Fuji Film has been around for a long time, uh, and in fact, dating back 25 years when we had industrial workshops uh, training people for this technologies uh, here at Penn State. Uh, Fuji Film sent lots of their employees uh, at their contract manufacturing, and on their webpage, they described a VLP, which is a virus like particles, as a basis of the contracts that they're currently working on. And there's numerous others, the Italy-based CMO, uh, AGC Biologics, and certainly uh, there are CMOs in, in, in other parts of the world uh, as well. So this is uh, really the, the end of this discussion, if you will, <laughs> okay. which is hardly, it's just the beginning, I guess, of what we're going to be experiencing over the next uh, uh, coming year or so in uh, not just the first vaccine that we're rolling out, but remember there are dozens of these that are, are moving forward that are different technologies, new, more traditional, easier to distribute, um, because we need to get this vaccines to everyone, uh, including remote locations where you maybe can't deliver cryogenically preserved um, uh, Pfizer. Uh, mRNA vaccines, like most of the discussion here, more the traditional uh, types of vaccines. Um, so that's it. I uh, I will be posting uh, this uh, on uh, on. I might as well speed it up on something like YouTube uh, for anyone that has interest. And I will on my website. I'll uh, for my lab. I'll, I'll put the the PowerPoint slides if anyone would like to use those for sharing instruction, share with your friends. Thanks. Yeah. Um.